Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are around the world. Thank you for being here. Um, welcome to the Symposium on Aging, Geroscience and Longevity. So as you know, aging is the greatest risk factor for most of the major human diseases in developed countries. And the research that you guys are doing has just been amazingly like transforming the state of what we know about aging and longevity interventions. And so I'm, oh, I'm Jessica Tyler, a senior editor at eLife. I am a chromatin person, but I also do some work on aging. And I felt that eLife would be a wonderful venue for the aging fields where everyone in biology could gain access to the great work that's going on in the aging field. And eLife would be a rapid, fair and transparent um, review journal for the aging field. So I really wanted to bring um, eLife to the attention of the aging field. So that was the reason behind doing this special issue. And we brought on Matt Cable in, who you all know is a, a leader in the aging field. Not only that, he's been an amazing partner in this special issue effort that's been going on for the past year nearly. We also brought on eight amazing guest editors from around the world. I'd like to thank those. Wei Wei Dang from Baylor, Yusin Su from Columbia University, Dario Ricardo Valenzano from the Max Planck Institute of Biology of Aging in Germany, Jing Dong Jackie Han from Peking University in China, Veronica Galvan at the UT Health San Antonio, Pankaj Kapahi from the Burke Institute, Jan Gruber from Yale, and Sarah Haag from the Karolinska Institute. And together we have handled 159 submissions for the special issue on aging. 21 have been accepted, 29 are still under consideration. And what this symposium is gonna do is really to showcase the work from selected accepted papers that will be coming out in the special issue. And with that, I'm gonna hand over the first session to Matt Cabling. Great, okay, th thanks Jess. Um, and, uh, and I also just wanna uh, uh, thank Jess for uh, organizing this special issue and, and um, for taking the lead in, uh, in editing this. So when I started at eLife, Jess, uh, Jess has been a senior editor at eLife for a while and I came in as a, a new kid on the block and now I have moved up also to senior editor at eLife. And I, and I just wanna um, emphasize just a couple of things that, that Jess uh, said, which is that I think this special issue has been a great way to bring eLife to the attention of the, the aging field. But I think the reverse is also important in that um, you know one of the goals of having this special, special issue is to, um, to, to bring the aging field into greater awareness in the broader scientific community. And I think eLife is the perfect forum for doing that. And I, th this special issue has exceeded my wildest expectations in terms of the number of really high quality papers that we've gotten across the whole diverse range of the, the biology of aging. And I hope that's something that you will appreciate from the talks today is, is indeed how, how diverse they are in terms of uh, aspects of aging that are being studied, the model organisms that are being employed. Um, I think this is such an exciting time in the field. And so I think this, this has been uh, just a, a really um, outstanding uh, experience uh, doing this special issue with, with Jess and all the staff at, at eLife. And so um, I, I think there's no reason not to, to kick it off and, and get started. Um, our first speaker uh, of the day is Peter Fedichev, who is the co-founder and CEO of Jero. Peter uh, is now based out of Singapore, and he's going to talk to us about uh, his paper on germline burden of rare damaging variants negatively affecting human health span and lifespan. And it looks like he's already got his slides shared, so take it away, Peter. Well, thank you very much uh, for, for the introduction and actually for the journal issue. So it was a pleasure to participate and uh, con to, to contribute. Well, I will tell you uh, about the work with such a long name, uh, which, which is in fact very simple inside. 
uh, the work was actually, the idea of the work was actually suggested uh, by Vadim Gladyshev. Uh, can, I, can, can, can I know that everything is fine? Yeah, cool. It looks good. Cool, thank you. So the, the idea was suggested by Vadim. Uh, we, uh, we have been working on genetics of human longevity uh, for a while uh, with a number of people. And then uh, suddenly Vadim approached us and, uh, and, uh, and asked uh, about uh, the po possible effect of uh, very rare mutations on human longevity, how much of human longevity genes we actually see when we investigate uh, common uh, uh, gene variants. Well, we know, although we, some of us doubt after some recent Kalika work that uh, quite uh, a lot of uh, variability of human longevity can be genetically uh, pre predefined. Nevertheless, uh, genome-wide association studies of human longevity did not return many uh, gene variants associated uh, with longevity. They well, return quite a lot, but the effect size is quite small. So I would say that uh, the amount of dark matter in the human longevity genome is still, uh, is still large. So uh, maybe we were thinking rare protein uh, variants, which are not, uh, which are not obvious uh, from uh, uh, standard genotyping uh, procedures, uh, are implicated in aging as well. So if, if yes, what is the effect? And uh, fortunately, over the last years, whole exome and now whole genome sequencing, sequencing are taken up. Uh, we have now UK Biobank. Uh, which had, uh, at the time of the work uh, published, uh, had 50,000 whole exomes available for consideration. They have just recently released another 150,000 uh, genomes, whole exomes, which means that we're well, slowly entering a situation where we have now access to ultra-rare mutations. So what we have done together with Vadim and his colleagues uh, is that we actually st studied the effect of the mutation frequency uh, well, the phenotype to aging. So we looked at specific uh, gene variants, which are uh, protein trun truncating uh, variants, those which are kind of obvious associated with the loss of function uh, for, the, for, the, for, for the protein product or, or the absence of, the, of this product. And we bind them according to their frequencies. Well, each of us is a walking mutant. We have, I don't know, uh, maybe 60, uh, well, 80, 60 uh, genes, uh, which have uh, protein truncating variants in at least one copy of the gene. But as you can imagine, uh, as we are getting into less frequent uh, uh, variants, we have less and less of them, but each of us has uh, about six uh, PTV variants, which are very rare, uh, less than uh, uh, one hundredth of a percent. So, most of them, at least in our data set, were splice donor acceptors and stop cut down uh, gains. So what was the relation, we asked ourselves, uh, between the number of such variants, the burden of such variants, and uh, human health and longevity? Well, and the, ans and the answer was pretty straightforward. So we decided that if those variants are, well, they sound at least bad, uh, protein truncating variants, so hopefully they have uh, the same sign, which means that the more you have, uh, the less uh, uh, years of life you may have. And this is indeed uh, the case. As you can see, the most rare uh, PTV variants, the number of them, the total number of them in the genome was uh, negatively associated from the Cox proportional hazard model point of view with the remaining lifespan in UK Biobank. I will tell you in a moment about that, but also with the health span in UK Biobank. So here we used two different components of UK uh, Biobank. We used the, uh, the overall data set, uh, which is the, uh, well, we used 40,000 uh, genetically British individuals to make sure that we are not uh, you know, scoring some artifacts of ancestry. And uh, among those, about, about 1,000 of them died within uh, 11 years uh, follow-up time. But uh, on top of that, we also created uh, other popular phenotypes used in uh, human genetic longevity research. We also used HealthSpan, which is the age of the first uh, chronic disease, but also mother at death and father at death, well, because we are sharing half of our genes from each of our parents. As you can see, there is a more or less consistent picture in all uh, phenotypes we have seen. Uh, the total number of uh, uh, presumably deleterious uh, variants uh, were ultra rare deleterious variants were associated with longevity in, in the negative way. If you look specifically at specific type of mutations, you would see that uh, those stop gain 
uh, where let's say the most consistent uh, features of the association between BPTV uh, variants and uh, human uh, longevity. Well, the, the effect is not small, by the way. So we looked at, uh, at uh, the first and fifths, uh, well, not quantities, but I mean, we looked at the people with the less number of uh, PTV, uh, rare PTV variants and with the most number of the rare PTV, PTV variants. And uh, this is just uh, the survival plot within the follow-up time. And as you can see, the result is not small. People who have more rare mutations uh, do indeed live uh, less and die faster. Well, I think the well, this is kind of expected, although this is still far, uh, far, far beyond the expectation. I mean, we still do not know where the rest of a lot of percentage of uh, lifespan variants, uh, which is presumably genetically uh, determined, uh, resides. Nevertheless, it's it's, it's uh, the step in the right direction. But the same result. I mean, the effect size of the uh, of ultra rare mutations uh, can. With respect to, to, to longevity, the effect on longevity can uh, can help you answer another important question. So we always think, uh, what is the role of uh, of uh, mutations, spontaneous mutations on lifespan? And here we have a glimpse of what it can, how, how this can work. Uh, we know, well, from the publications from literature, that uh, there is a certain spontaneous mutation rate in our body. So in every cell in our body, there are spontaneous mutations, and some of them are those PTV mutations. So you can think uh, for the genome of our SI as size, how many of those PTV mutations are produced every year, and then you can multiply it by effect, and then uh, correct for the Gombert's mortality model. And we can see that the expected effect of spontaneous mutations on uh, age-dependent mortality acceleration is very, very small. So, which means that maybe at least uh, when we talk about human longevity, uh, by the time uh, uh, associated well related to the average life expectancy, the effect of those spontaneous mutations is not very large. So, I will conclude with that. Uh, I mean, the work is not uh, very sophisticated, but I think it's still very interesting. Uh, we do observe that uh, ultra rare mutations have more effect on phenotype than common mutations. Uh, I like this picture because this is exactly the view people got after World War II when mathematicians tried to investigate uh, uh, how to redesign airplanes to make them more durable and survivable. So that's more or less what we're trying to do here uh, in aging. So the first observation was that uh, the airplanes are coming back and have lots of holes. So let's reinforce the places where there are many holes. So these are our common genetic variants, which can change a lot. Well, uh, the correct answer was the other, uh, the, the other way around. You have to reinforce those places of airframes where there are no holes, because every hole there means death. So that's exactly what we see here. We see common gene variants, which can be changed at will. These are not your health. These are your ancestry, hair color, eye color, and so on. But there are very, you know, very, very uh, lethal uh, variants, which if change, changed, produce large effects. And that's where the whole exome and hopefully whole genome sequencing will, uh, I hope, provide us with lots of interesting variants of genes with larger effect on human longevity. So I would conclude with that. And I would like to th say thanks uh, to everyone uh, present uh, on the work. Uh, people from uh, my group, uh, which is uh, Alexander Zenin and Andrei Tarhov, and also to Anastasia Bidak and obviously Vadim, who was uh, the brain behind the, the, the first version of this work. Thank you. Great. Th thank you, Peter, for that um, very clear talk. And I just want to remind all of the uh, participants to please put your questions in chat. We have a couple of questions. Uh, so the first one comes from Alex Chen, um, who's wondering, he got a 30X Nebula genomics genome scan. How can he find his PTVs from the genomics report? Well, um, uh, we have uh, Andrei Tarkov in our group uh, who has also received his uh, uh, genome scan. And he has just produced such a list. So if you, if you mail me here, I will contact uh, you with Andre, and I think he will share the code. Great, thank, thank you. Uh, although uh, you may be setting yourself up if you start offering to have people email you uh, with their genomics reports for a lot of work, but uh, thanks, that's, that's great. <laughs> well, I, just, uh, I just promised to connect. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Uh, okay, we have another question. Uh, uh, very nice work. Did you observe any sex-specific variants 
that has an individual burden on maternal or paternal side in your study? Uh, yes, uh, well, surprisingly, we have seen uh, sex dependent effect. I mean, one, one of it, it is uh, serious and mysterious because when we look at health span and lifespan, we can see that certain specific types of uh, rare TV variants affect different sexes in different ways. We have a table for that, no explanations. This is, you know, low quality, I mean, in quotes, uh, lower quality observational science, so we don't know the reason. The anecdotal part is, uh, I have on my, uh, on my uh, slides, uh, you may mention that there is an association of PTV burden of an individual with mother's age at death, but not father's age at death. You may think whatever you want about that, so it's also not known why, but maybe it's because fathers uh, of that generation were involved maybe in war, I don't know. So it may happen that uh, aging did not contribute much or as much uh, of an effect into the death tables of the uh, of uh, one parent uh, in comparison to the other parent. So yes, we do observe some sex uh, related effects. Uh, they are reported, but not totally explained. Great, thanks. Uh, another question is, are the, re are the results stable with changes of definition of PTV? For example, the frequency of PTV? Well, you can, uh, can, can you please repeat because I lost a bit. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but the question is, uh, are the results stable with changes of definition of PTV, for example, the frequency of PTV? Yeah, well, thank you for the question. I mean, once you have such a, such a frequency dependence, you have to be careful about that. So I'm happy to report that since three weeks, we have 200,000 uh, genomes, and the result is there with the property value improvement according to the number of samples. So I would say that this result has been cross-validated. Okay, if I thanks. Understand the question correctly. Yeah, and then uh, this is something I was also sort of wondering about is, do you think that your findings can inform functional studies in, for example, model organisms? Are there specific pathways that are enriched? Well, I hope yes, we still need to prove that. Uh, there is a follow-up version of this work where we do study specific pathways and we have generated a bunch of hypotheses and then we're asking our friends uh, nematodes to confirm them. So the work is in progress at this time. Great, okay, thank you. Uh, I'm not seeing any other questions. Uh, so so uh, let's just thank Peter for the, the great talk and uh, he did, Put his email in the um, in the chat. So if anybody has additional questions, you can either put them in the chat, and Peter may be able to answer them there, or you can email him directly. Yeah, there was an error in the email, so I have fixed that. Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry, one more time. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So we will now uh, go on to the second uh, speaker of this session. So Sarah Hogg, as just mentioned, um, Sarah was one of our uh, fantastic uh, special e uh, editors for, for the special issue. Um, and uh, she also is an author for the special issue. She is at the Department of Medical Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the Karolinska Institute from Sweden. So we're, we went from Singapore to Sweden. We're going jumping all over the globe and time zones. Uh, and her talk title is Measurements of Biological Age in Swedish Longitudinal Study of Aging. Let's get started. Um, well, thank you for inviting me to this uh, symposium today. Uh, so I'm not the first author of the paper. It's my brilliant student, Chia, uh, who has done all the analysis of our paper. And she couldn't, unfortunately, do the presentation today. Maybe she's listening. I don't know. So. Uh, Yes, so the talk today, I will uh, present some of the background on what biological age is in, in human cohort studies and some of the knowledge gap, which led us to the aim of our study. Uh, and briefly go into some of the methods and then present the results of the paper. So biological age in human studies, uh, it can be measured in many, many different ways, but it should be a measure that is correlated with chronological age. And it should also be something that provides information on top of chronological age so that people at the same age 
can have different um, levels of biological age. And that means that a, a person with a higher biological age would also have a higher risk for age-related diseases and mortality later in life. And there are many layers of an aging metrics today. So we can think about um, molecular and cellular mechanisms of aging and how you can quantify that. And this is what we like to refer to as the hallmarks of aging and has been written uh, and referred to intensively over the last years in the aging literature. We also have uh, biological metrics of aging uh, where we look at more global measurements. So uh, many of the omics clocks, for example, and the most uh, common one is of course the epigenetic clock, very, very often used now in, in studies. But we also have other clinical metrics of aging where we can think about uh, an individual or even whole organ or whole system level of aging. So we try to quantify this uh, in humans by looking at disability, uh, frailty, different frailty measures, multimorbidity and functional measures such as cognitive and physical function. So what we don't know is, of course, how all these different layers of biological aging interact with each other and how we can use that information to learn more about the aging pathway. So we have uh, multiple different biological age metrics that has been proposed, such as uh, the omics clocks, for example, and the clinical, different clinical biomarkers that can be combined into uh, summarized metrics, such as uh, the um, Clemera de Bal algorithm and so on. Uh, and some of these uh, measurements have been very well studied lately, and we understand how they work to predict mortality and health related outcomes. But what has not really been known is um, how many of them can be combined together in the same population, and how then the different biological age metrics correlate together, uh, and how the mortality association will then be uh, predicted when we combine different metrics. So this led us then to the aim of our study, and we wanted to understand a bit more around this and estimate the correlations between different biological age metrics in the same population and individuals, and also then to explore the associations with mortality. So both separate, as we know them, but putting all of the different biological age metrics jointly in the same model as well. And the methods, this study that we used to do uh, this investigation was a longitudinal aging study. It's called the Swedish Adoption Twin Study of Aging, uh, SATSA for short, and it's part of a, it's a sub-study of the Swedish Twin Registry. And in this study we have up to nine in-person testings between 1996 and 2014, where we collected biological um, data and on, on top of that a lot of questionnaire data and other registered data as well. So at each of these IPTs, uh, a maximum of nine different biological age measurements that we used in this paper uh, were collected. So a maximum of 845 individuals had at least one of these measurements available in this study. But many of the individuals had uh, many of the different measurements available and also with repeated measurements over the, this time period. And the different assessments that we used uh, were the leukocyte telomere length using qPCR method and the epigenetic clocks. And we quantified this with a human methylation 450K bead chip array. And we had a um, multi-tissue Horvat clock, which was the first one that was uh, really initiated. And we also used the whole blood Hanum clock and the um, pheno age, which is a quantification of physiological age and also the fairly new grim age clock, which is more of a mortality predictor clock. We also uh, combine our own physiological age metrics by summarizing 10 different biomarkers from blood and physical examinations uh, in using um, Clemera Dobal algorithm with some modifications. And this uh, we have put into um, uh, bioprotocols for the assessment of how we did this physiological age. Um, score. We also did a cognition, general cognition assessment using uh, different domains of um, cognition, so verbal and spatial ability, memory and perceptual speed combined into this general uh, cognition score. 
We also did the functional aging index, which is something we come up with on, on our own um, within the cohort, uh, where we combined also different functional uh, measurements. So here we used vision, hearing, lung function, uh, grip strength, and uh, gait speed. Uh, and we standardized them and combined them into a summarized score as well. And finally, we had assessed the frailty index, which is based on the Rockford accumulation deficit model, where we included uh, 42 different health items that were self-reported in the participants in the SATSA cohort. So all of these are together the, the nine different um, biological age assessments that we used longitudinally in, in this uh, paper. And we also had uh, mortality associations uh, from the Swedish population register linkage up to the end of 2018 included. We did uh, correlations of the different biological age assessments and we did this in a longitudinal way to maximize the power and the samples that we had in the study. Uh, and by doing this, we had a method where we could um, uh, adjust for the relatedness also in the correlation coefficients. For the association with uh, all cause mortality, we performed Cox regression models. So a time to event model where we adjusted for age, sex, education, smoking, and uh, BMI in the models. And we also included robust standard errors to adjust for the twin relatedness that we had in the cohort. So two different types of uh, Cox regression models were um, done. So we had this one that we call the one biological age models where we assess the association to mortality and for the risk uh, for each of the um, assessment individually. And then finally, we did a combination model where we put all of them together in a joint model uh, and also together with the covariates to see how they would behave in a joint model. So moving on then to uh, results. And uh, in the baseline measurements, we had uh, 845 participants and uh, around 60% were women and the mean age uh, at baseline was 63 years. So this is um, a co an aging cohort and we follow them from uh, midlife and, and onwards. So from we, what we can see here from the figure as well, these are the nine different markers uh, and the longitudinal trajectories. And telomere length and cognitive, general cognitive function uh, are declining with age, which is, of course, what we expect. The telomere is getting shorter each, each time we each year we age. And also cognitive function is, is a declining uh, event, while all the other biological age assessments by construction then is something that is increasing with age uh, and more follows this biological age um, um, metric or idea. And what else? We could see that for the functional measure, so the last row of the figure here, uh, we had cognitive function and this um, functional aging index that we composed and the frailty index. All of them seem to have some sort of acceleration in the trajectory. So from around the age of 70 years, there seems to be some sort of increase in this uh, slope. Uh, so it's not really a linear uh, model anymore. We could also note that there is a sex difference for most of the biological age uh, metrics that we saw. Uh, and this means that there is also, which we can note here, this um, interesting sex paradox, because in the cellular mar and, and molecular markers of biological age, we can see that uh, for telomere length and for the different epigenetic clocks, that women have uh, a lower biological age. So they have longer telomeres and shorter biological age assessed by the uh, epigenetic clocks, meaning that they have a more uh, beneficial profile. Whereas if we look at the functional uh, measures, so here in particular, the functional aging index and frailty index, we can see that women have a higher um, functional and uh, frailty index uh, and are worse off in terms of biological assessments here. So there is some sort of paradox going on here for them for what is noted in the cellular and molecular mechanism versus the functional markers where women have worse function and uh, worse health in the later um, span in life as well. And then we looked at the correlations uh, between all of these different uh, biological age assessments. Uh, and as we expect, they all correlate very well with each other. 
and the red um, corresponds then to high correlation coefficients and the blue is a negative correlation coefficient and the blue is then of course for the telomere length and the cognitive decline where we would expect um, inverse uh, correlation coefficient. But what is interesting to note then is that if you adjust for chronological age in all of these correlation coefficients, uh, there is not so strong correlation patterns uh, noted anymore. So we can see on, on the top, we can see that there is still a functional cluster. So we have a, a, a fairly high around 0.3 uh, correlation coefficients uh, still left in the correlations between the cognitive function, the functional aging index and frailty index. Uh, but for the others, it's not very, uh, it's not so apparent correlation structures anymore. There is some sort of cluster also for the epigenetic clocks where there is, um, at least for the Horvat and Hanum clock, we can see some sort of um, fairly strong correlation still left. But this means that a lot of the correlations were really uh, driven by the chronological age um, correlation itself. And when we regress that out, um, they really represent different parts of the aging um, pathways. So that is an interesting uh, notion that I think that more and more papers come to the same conclusion now. And finally, then we looked at the mortality associations. In, and first, we had this one uh, biological age model where we looked at them individually. And then we had the combined model. So, in the first um, forest plot here to the left, uh, we can see that almost all of the biological age measurements, except for telomere length in, in this particular cohort, uh, shows an uh, association with um, mortality. So, we can predict the hazard from using these. Uh, measurements. But interestingly, then when we combine all the um, biological age measurements together and put them in the same model, much of the estimates uh, are attenuated or the effects are attenuated in the model. So what we can see is that from the functional area, the functional uh, uh, markers, it's only the frailty index that is still predictive of mortality. And from the aging clocks, we can see that it's the Grim Age and the Horvat clock that are still uh, predictive of mortality, meaning that they are significantly predictive on top of each other. So they provide some sort of predictive value on top of each other in this model. Whereas the, the effects of the other markers are really attenuated and not really contributing to have an important value in the combined model. So I think this is really something that was not or has not been shown in, in any other cohorts before. Um, it's also, of course, uh, restricted to what type of data you have access to and what type of analysis you can do. So I think this was the first time we showed with so many different markers how it behaves together in predicting mortality. So to conclude then, uh, we looked at the longitudinal growth of different functional uh, biological age index and could see that they accelerated around the age of 70 years. Uh, sex differences were also apparent in, in the way that we perhaps expect them to be, but also pointing out this um, uh, paradox with the molecular and cellular and functional aging. And correlations between the different biological age metrics were attenuated after adjusting for chronological age. Uh, and most of them, except for telomere length, were individually predictive of mortality. But when putting them in this joint model, we could see that only some of them were still important to have in the model. So maybe also resembling the correlation clusters that we could see that there is enough to include one functional measure, uh, whereas two of the aging clocks were, were still uh, predictive of mortality. So yes, with that, um, thank you for your attention. And I would really like to thank the funders and my brilliant student Chia, who did all of this work, and also my colleague Nancy Peterson, who is the PI of SATSA and responsible for the nice uh, study collection. Yes, I may take some questions if there are any. Great, Th thank you, Sarah, right on time. Uh, looks like we have a few questions popping up. So uh, the first one, is uh, molecular-based methods, telomere lengths, epigenetics, et cetera, are tissue specific um, and mostly use data from one tissue, blood generally, while clinically-based methods are not necessarily tissue specific. How much do you think tissue effects influence methods to predict biological age? 
Uh, and do you think it's fair to compare methods from molecular data versus clinical data? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's a good question. And of course, it's tissue specific specific uh, estimates when you look at cellular and, and molecular markers, and we know that. Uh, but for telomere lengths, for example, we know also that um, measurements in blood is fairly well correlated to other tissues. There are, of course, exceptions and to that, but it's somehow perhaps the circulation is more capturing the bigger picture of the uh, individual as well. But for other tissues, of course, it will be helpful if you, the more you have, the better you can, you can understand uh, the mechanisms, I think. And uh, for the clinical perspective, yeah, it's, um, again, you're capturing more of the, of the bigger picture then. So if you look at frailty, for example, it's, uh, you, you get a picture of the whole body and the health of that person, which is also perhaps more tightly linked to clinical aspects and, um, uh, clinical outcomes. So I think that is also very useful, but of course you don't go into the molecular details then. So in my perspective, I, I think we need both or everything. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think, you know, and Sarah, maybe you can comment on this. I mean, I think that, you know, the, the, the blood-based measures potentially tell you something different, right? But, but we also need things that are useful. And, and obviously we can't take biopsies from thousands of people of, of every tissue. So I think, it, I think you need both, right? You need the clinical assays where you can actually look at function in different tissues and organs, but we also need to be pragmatic and work with the, the kinds of biological samples that, that we're likely to be able to use um, going forward that, that we can get access to from a large number of people. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, okay, so there's a few other questions. Uh, hi, very good talk. Uh, did you try and fit an age by predictor model in the Cox models? For telomere length, we know that especially in old people, this is not a good predictor of mortality, but less than 65, it is okay. Uh, and related, do correlations between these measures break down with age? Um, that's a good question. I think we, I think we looked into that age um, interaction terms in the models, uh, and I think it's in the paper. I would have to refer to that. I don't know the exact details of that, but of course it's important. And we, I've, we've seen from other studies that in terms of the predictive value, a lot of the hazards really go down. They decrease with age. So if you are able to look at um, risks at midlife, it's probably much, much more useful than in late, later life in many of these uh, measurements, yes. And then there's a, a question about, just, a, just out of curiosity, have you thought about adding to the analysis the DNA M age based on Horvath's clock, the newest one, which is based on skin and blood tissues? So I think it's asking about newer, newer clocks that have come out since you did this analysis. Yeah, yeah, I, we, we have that already created. Uh, and I don't know, we did not include it in this analysis, but I, I have a separate analysis on that as well. Uh, I still think that the Grim Age is perhaps the, um, the best one in terms of predicting clinical usefulness uh, for, for mortality because it's created in that way. And we could also see that it was the highest um, hazard ratio for that clock. So I think that is still better than the, the skin and muscle clock. Okay, thanks. Uh... Was there any other remarkable accelerating jump over 80 besides 70 that was discern discernible? No, I don't think so. I, I think what, what we saw is really this um, uh, change in acceleration of slope around age 70. And I think in, in terms of the cognition, it's been known for long that around retirement age, then this is the time when you see a, a big change in, in function, in cognitive function. And now we could see that it's, it's similar also for other function, uh, functional metrics and freight index as well. So okay. I think this is, this is where the, the, the change is happening. Okay, one last question. Uh, how do you explain that different epigenetic measures show an independent association with mortality while only grim age is created using mortality as an outcome? Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting question. And I mean, it's an ongoing discussion of um, 
how the different aging clocks or the epigenetic clocks are created, where the first ones were really trying to predict chronological age, which is uh, in one way not a good way of, of looking at biological age, because we don't want to predict chronological age, we want to predict biological age. So I think the Grim Age clocks and other clocks have really been like what we call the second generation clocks, where we try to adapt the, the way that the clocks are created so that we can look at biological age uh, itself. Because by really by intuition, we don't, we don't want to predict chronological age. That's what they do in forensics. So I think this is why there is a big difference between the first Horvath clock and then, for example, the Grim Age clock. They all work somehow to predict health outcomes, but in different ways. Um, so yeah, I think we're still far from understanding exactly the mechanism behind it. And I still think we have a lot to do in this area. Yeah, that, that, thanks, Sarah. That's a great uh, finishing thought, I, I think, for, for this talk. And uh, um, clocks obviously are you know, a, a major area of interest and in research in the field right now. And I think there are lots of questions about chronological versus biological age and mechanism and what these things are telling us. And um, just as a teaser, we will have Morgan Levine, who is also going to talk about uh, her work with some, some uh, clocks uh, coming up in a session later today. And so I will come back to this topic. And I think these same conceptual questions keep coming up over and over and over again. So lots to be done in this area. So thanks for the fantastic talk. Okay, uh, up next, I think Dario is here now. Um, so Dario Valenzano is our uh, third speaker of this session. Uh, yep, I see him. Hey, Dario, good to see you. Uh, so Dario is at the Max Planck Institute for Biology of Aging uh, in Germany. Uh, and he is going to talk about interspecies differences in population size, shape, life history, and genome evolution. All right. Can you see my presentation? We can see all of your slides. What about now? Yep, looks great. All right, let's see presenter view. Like this. Yes. All right, great. perfect. So it's great to be here. Um, it's great to discuss about this work. Um, I want to thank you, Matt and Jess, for um, putting this symposium together. Uh, I think this is a great initiative. So the work I will present you today uh, is the work that uh, has been largely conducted by a former uh, PhD student in the lab, the first author, David Willensen. Here is David. And uh, um, so I graduated last year. So what I want to stress about this work, and I'm very excited about, um, is that uh, this work started uh, from a discussion uh, in the lab and then moved on to the field in Zimbabwe. So we went and collected the samples that we use for uh, the, you know, the, whole, the whole study uh, really in the, in, the, in, the, in the puddles in Zimbabwe. And I will talk a little bit about that. And then David carry on the, the, the whole study from the field work to the molecular analysis in the lab, uh, to the genome sequencing, to the analysis of the data, the bioinformatic pipeline, to the uh, population genetics and genomics done to, uh, to tease out the genetic variants associated with lifespan differences um, among populations that I will tell about. So it's really like a fantastic story, started from, from field work all the way to, to data analysis. So data harvesting, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the main question that we're trying to tackle with this work is what is the evolutionary origin of the uh, genetic variants that limit lifespan? In other words, we are interested in understanding how within a species, different population get to live shorter uh, and what genetic variants are responsible for shortening of lifespan within a species. So what is the evolutionary basis for the emergence of deleterious gene variants in a population? So rather than thinking about what you know, makes you live longer as a species or as a subpopulation within a species, we are thinking about the, the other way, the other direction. So what uh, contracts lifespan? And so uh, in other words, uh, we want to really dig into the um, evolutionary mechanisms uh, that uh, are in action when uh, uh, lifespan uh, is contracted, aging maybe is accelerated. Uh, and uh, this type of question um, can be uh, asked uh, when you have at hand 
a system that uh, has a natural variation in lifespan. So we are not uh, addressing here what variants can be manipulated in the lab, uh, individual variants, but we're talking about genome-wide variants uh, in natural populations. Okay, so we have uh, a quite handy framework to uh, address this question. And uh, so there are two uh, general ways to think about how mutations that cause aging come about in evolution. Uh, and I will briefly um, discuss them. So in one such scenario, you have new germline variants, like this little C here, that leads to increased fitness. Maybe because this variant, when acquired, leads to higher resilience uh, and eventually to higher reproductive success to the individuals carrying it. This same variant, however, may have adverse effects late in life that have no impact on fitness or that cumulatively have a limited impact on fitness, but still these variants are favored by selection. So we are, in other words, talking about variants that are positively selected. When a variant is positive selected, it's uh, um, kinetic, uh, the, 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 the frequency over generation of these variants will follow a predictable um, rule. So you will have an increase in frequency until it reaches fixation, which means most of the individual, if not all individual, will carry that variant because it's advantageous. So this is the textbook case of hard sweep positive, sele hard sweep positive selection. Now, another scenario, uh, um, it's quite different, uh, consists in having a variant emerging in a population that has no effect on fitness, no whatsoever, or very limited effect on fitness. This variant, uh, at the same time, may be uh, associated with uh, age-related diseases and decrease resilience, uh, robustness late in life. Now, the distribution and the frequency of these or such variants in a population, it's very different from the, from the previous one. You expect completely different landscape of these mutations in the two scenarios. So we can study genomes of long-lived and short-lived populations and species to mine for variants that have evolved in this way or in this way. And these two uh, ways of looking at evolution and the evolution of these variants have, you know, have very famous names in the uh, evolutionary theory of aging. One is known as antagonistic pleiotropism, and it underlies really positive selection, adaptive evolution. This is really what uh, George Williams is talking about when he thinks about antagonistic pleiotropism. He said mutation accumulation, war, is a scenario that population geneticists would uh, mm, uh, would make it more similar to uh, what happens in a scenario of nearly neutral evolution, which uh, is what Ota, um, Tomoko Ota and, uh, um, has, has, been, has been proposing as a, as a pot potential mechanism to explain gene variants uh, uh, distribution across populations. So we want to know and we want to use natural populations to study uh, this type of problem and to see how aging related variants distribute in population. So we look at the, at the world out there, we look at species in their natural environment. And our uh, taxon of choice is uh, that of killifishes, African killifish in particular. These are wonderful system uh, in my opinion because they are naturally, they represent a natural experiment in diversification uh, of life history traits evolution. So multiple times independently in the phylogeny of this taxon, you have evolution of short lifespan and longer lifespan. So we can really study the evolutionary basis, the evolutionary signature associated with different life history traits. So past work from our group actually has shown that different species of killifish uh, have particular genomic features that evolve hand in hand when long lifespan or short lifespan evolve. But what I want to talk about today instead is what happens within a species. So when you take one species, uh, and so you look at the micro evolutionary scale, so within a species, different populations, how can we explain differences in gene variants leading to longer short lifespan among different populations? And this is exactly the case that notobranchus, the, the genus notobranchus and several species within the genus notobranchus offer as, as a model. So uh, just a few, uh, a few introductory slide about uh, annual killifish, the short-lived killifish, so they have a very peculiar, unique life cycle. They um, complete their life cycle in, um, when water is available in um, Savannah, uh, Africa. And so they hatch when the rainfalls come. Uh, they uh, reach actual maturation in a few weeks. They spawn, they lay their eggs. They will keep on reproducing for several months, but their, their eggs and their embryos in their eggs will uh, arrest their development for several months, up to several years, until the next rainy season comes. So there is no overlap of generation within one season. Most of the time of the year in the dry areas, 
embryos will survive in the dry mud. Okay, so uh, like I said before, we have long-lived and short-lived killifish species, uh, sorry, populations within the same species. So the, the, the short-lived populations come from extremely arid areas. And so this is Southeast Africa, Zimbabwe and Mozambique. This is the area where we conducted our field work and we collected our samples. Like I said, most of the year, short-lived killifish live in an environment which is like this, and you really have to dig down in the mud to collect the, the eggs. So you can actually extract them from the mud. And this is a pond, uh, you know, how the pond looks like most of the year. So we know that different killifish populations are distributed in a gradient of um, precipitation, very few precipitation, very arid environment here in red to wet and wetter and wetter area as you move towards, for example, the coast of the Indian Ocean. Here, the precipitation lasts longer, rainy seasons are longer, and killifish also live longer in those environments. Just to show you how ecology explains these features in killifish. So in the wet areas, you tend to have large ponds like these, even small lakes with a lot of fish. And uh, there can be a lot of exchange of, uh, uh, of, of populations between the different, uh, the different localities, because these areas are often under monsoon, you know, this is a monsoon area and they get flooded oftentimes. So there is a lot of gene flow between uh, ponds in the wet areas. The dry areas instead above here are, you know, represented by smaller, uh, you know, uh, localities, smaller populations, smaller ponds that last for less time every year. They have a very small population. So in each pond, you have continuous bottleneck and repeated bottlenecks. And so the gene flow also among these populations is very limited. So this, we predicted already back in 2015 that this actually would lead to severe genetic drift and potentially affect, you know, um, uh, this might have affected uh, the distribution of um, gene variants in these populations. So this is the case for the turquoise killifish, where you have populations living in dry environment, which have this type of scenario, and population in the wet environment, these, which have this kind of scenario. From these populations, you have short-lived populations. In these localities, you have longer-lived population. Now, you may think that short lifespan may be adaptive, that individuals living in the dry areas may actually be adapted to their environment. However, what it's very important to point out is that the time to sexual reproduction in both dry and wet areas is the same. So killifish don't display within the species, the turquoise killifish, differences in timing of sexual maturation. In other words, both population from dry and wet environments reach sexual maturation at the same time, and their you know, uh, reproductive lifespan is shorter in the dry populations than in the wet populations. So we tested actually whether the bottleneck is real and whether the population size indeed is smaller in the population that lives shorter. So this is actually, um, we seek, so we collected uh, uh, samples, fish from four different localities here represented three, but actually there were two localities in the dry area here. So this is a dry area and these are like more and more wet area. And uh, by pooling and sequencing different individuals from these localities, we could actually uh, assess the, from genetic polymorphism, the effective population size, which is a, is a measure of um, actually the actively breeding individuals and is a, me is a measure of genetic diversity, which can be become smaller and smaller as you go to the dry area. This is a PSEMC plus plot that represents actually population size. Each of these lines is a population, is, um, represents population size over time. So on the right is the past and on the left is the present. So as you move, for example, a long time towards the present on the orange line, population size undergoes a bottleneck, a severe shrinkage in population size. For these other lines, instead, you have increased population size in recent times. And actually, the orange line here represent actually the, uh, the, 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 the short-lived populations that come from these arid areas in Zimbabwe. All the other populations actually have undergone recently an expansion of population size. So indeed, from population genetics, we can observe directly that there's been severe bottlenecks affecting the dry populations. Now, uh, is it true though that uh, smaller effective population size affects the uh, amount of, 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 of gene variants positively selected and increases genomic load, in other words, the accumulation of deleterious gene variants? To answer this question, we can actually assess, we can weigh the number of adaptive variation and the frequency of adaptive variation in a given genome by using the so-called mcdonald kreitman alpha test. I'm not going to go into details because, you know, for the sake of time, but what this McDonald-Kreitman-Alpha, this is an asymptotic McDonald-Kreitman-Alpha tells you, it actually compares 
genetic variation within and between, uh, so within populations uh, and between species. So ancestral versus actually uh, polymorphic variants. Uh, and uh, it compares this variation in neutral and non-neutral variants. In other words, amino acid leading, you know, changing variants versus neutral synonymous uh, um, leading variants. And what you can, well, all you need to know about this, this, this slides here is that um, the red line uh, represents the short-lived population, which are the bottleneck, the smaller populations here. And the fact that the Y, you know, the Y, um, the Y, um, uh, axis here is, is um, values are lower for the for the red population indicates that uh, shortly population have a weaker have a smaller portion of the genome under positive selection at all frequency bins and in particular as you move to the low derived allele frequencies you have more and more slightly you know deleterious gene variants so these negative values of McDonald Kreutzmann alpha indicate an accumulation of deleterious gene variants specifically in the uh, small populations. So this is done actually using two outgroup species, Notobranchius racovi and Notobranchius ortonotus, and the result actually is robust to this test. Not only we can assess the genome wide that is lower portion of the genome under positive selection in the, in the short lived population, but we can also assess based on uh, the coding variants, uh, the impact on, you know, the phenotypic impact of these variants. And we can actually find that in the short lived population, GMP, the red ones, you have a larger portion of early stops. So uh, stop gain. So you have a lot of pseudogenization that is happening in the smaller population compared to the larger population. In other words, yes, it does seem like, does seem like you know, smaller population size leads to an accumulation of slightly deleterious gene variants that we believe cumulatively may lead to shortening of lifespan in these species. So to conclude, uh, David also ran together with Ray, the second author on this paper, they ran the, um, Test, which is called direction of selection, and is a distribution of variants that are on the left negative are actually driven by relaxation of purifying selection are deleterious on the right instead are adaptive and on the middle at zero point are neutral. And so what you can study is actually what is the nature of these genetic variants that are other deleterious or adaptive. So um, if you are on a positive on the green side, these are adaptive variants. If you are on the left side, these are deleterious gene variants. Well, all you need to know is that uh, for particular for the, for the short-lived populations, we have a large number of genes involved in the wind pathway and in Alzheimer's disease, neurodegenerative diseases, and immune function, as well as cancer, that have accumulated um, over time uh, and they have fixed, that means that they have high frequency of deleterious gene variants for terms associated with de degeneration. So now why is this helpful? Because this type of population genetic approach leads us to list of gene variants that can be tested actually in the laboratory. So now we have our tables, we can go back to those and we can test the, uh, the phenotypic impact of, of each of these variants on a specific pathway. So to conclude, what we have found is a connection between demography, population genetics, and genome evolution. And I didn't have the chance to, 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 to talk about it, but this paper also provides a new genome uh, assembly for the turquoise killifish, the most recent uh, reference genome for this species. We see that population size matters in the accumulation, in the efficacy in which selection can remove the deleterious gene variants. In particular, small populations, population with smaller effective population size lead to a higher number, a higher load of deleterious gene variants. And this we believe leads to a shortening of lifespan specifically in this population. So uh, this is uh, the conclusive slide. Uh, and this is the acknowledgement. I would like to thank the whole lab, in particular, the people who did the work are David here and Ray, uh, and also our collaborators uh, uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, uh, Martin Reichert, and this is our funding. And if we have time, I'd be happy to answer questions. Great, Th thanks, Dario. Um, every time I hear you talk, I realize that I I picked the wrong model organisms to work in because I never get to go to Zimbabwe. Oh, you can come that. anytime, Matt. <laughs> I'm going to take you up on that. Uh, yeah, looks like no, no, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> okay, uh, there are if beautiful you have wild dogs actually in Zimbabwe. You know, there are the village <laughs> dogs. They are wonderful. Um, so if you have questions, please post them in the chat. I I'll I'll start, and I, I don't know that I really formed this well, even in my own head. But, you know, what the, I guess the question in my mind is when you have these deleterious variants that, that pop up in these short-lived populations, 
um, it's easy for me to think about how you would get, you know, sort of randomly acu accumulating mutations right. and processes that that will limit lifespan. I think what's interesting is at least it looks like what you see is in the, is mutations accumulating in pathways and mechanisms that seem fundamentally linked to the biology of aging. Like these, not all of them, but many of them, you can they, they tie right into the hallmarks of aging. And I wonder if you have thoughts on why would that be the case that these, these deleterious mutations that pop up in these populations, you could right, make right, right. Great more question. the aging process, right? Rather than just random stuff. Well, so think about this way. If, you, if your deleterious gene variants affect early life um, processes like uh, um, embryonic survival, or um, time of sexual maturation, even, you know, or um, sex organ maturation, um, even in the small populations where selection is lousy, even then the effects, so natural selection will wipe those out. Uh, so in other words, what I'm trying to say is that the, gene var the variations in aging uh, pathways may be dispensable. So th these are not highly deleterious gene variants. These are slightly deleterious gene variants. So these are actually bearable. And so what we believe also from our previous work in uh, comparative genomics of aging across different species rather than different populations is that uh, uh, if anything, positive selection in killifish, in annual killifish in the short lived is compensatory. In other words, you produce a lot of damage. This, you accumulate a lot of tiny little you know, dents uh, in the uh, in the in the canvas of this uh, uh, of this aging pathway, and then the the residual uh, genetic variation uh, will be used by natural selection to compensate for those for those for those uh, losses, basically. So we think that there is a lot of redundancy in the aging pathway, and those are slightly deleterious gene variants. These are not highly deleterious gene variants, but they are just a lot. So it's a polygenic trait. It's not simple genetic architecture with one main locus. It's actually for probably the one of the most polygenic traits, lifespan and aging that you can imagine. It's you know even more polygenic than height or probably weight. Right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, so we have uh, one question. Uh, the population genetics of variants are consistent with the demographics, but there is no direct evidence to connect the accumulation of deleterious variants to the shorter lifespan, right? So it's... I guess the question is, do you have direct evidence connecting the accumulation of the deleterious variants? Right. To it's a great the question. It's a, it's, a, it's a crucial point. So what we try, I, I agree, I agree. So we, you know, uh, it's very hard to prove that. Um, um, so, so far we think that this is the most parsimonious explanation that we have. We don't, you know, um, let's put it this way, right? So uh, the alternative uh, hypothesis that I presented initially is that positively selected variants in other words, a few very highly frequent variants are those that lead short lifespan, you know, that drive short lifespan in the shortly populations. But we don't see evidence for that. But we don't see the evidence of a few gene variants that are unique to the shortly populations. So we see that genome wide, that is like a high, humongous gene, you know, gen uh, genomic load in the, in the short lived populations. Uh, another thing is that we, uh, uh, we see a association, so there is also like a timing of expression. So we see that um, uh, genes that are expressed later on in life are those that are under more relaxation of purifying selection in the short lived population. We have done this analysis on the based on the transcriptome. But you know, if you were to test each of those variants, probably uh, none of them would alone lead to shortening of lifespan. This is a polygenic trait, like I said before. So. Great, Th thank you. So uh, we are right on time. So we will move on to the, the next speaker. Thanks again, Dario, that was fantastic. Um, so we are at the last speaker for this session, uh, John Ahn. Uh, so this is really sort of a treat for me to get to introduce John. Um, John did his PhD thesis in, in my lab and now he has gone on to, uh, to, to, to run his own laboratory in the School of Dentistry at the University of Washington. And John is sort of a rare breed in uh, the field of, of aging research in that he is a uh, licensed dentist who practices clinically um, and also has a PhD working on the biology of aging. And 
um, I think it's it's uh, it's kind of neat that John is really taking the geroscience approach in the sense that um, geroscience is is the idea or the the area of research to try to understand the mechanisms that link biological aging to disease. And John is one of the one of the few who is doing this in the context of aging of the the oral cavity. Um, so so it's really really great. Uh, and fun for me to get to introduce John's talk on the application of geroscience to extend oral health span. And your slides look great, so take it away. Great, uh, thank you, Matt. And uh, thank you, Jess, and thank you, Eli, for uh, the opportunity to speak today. Um, so as Matt mentioned, my name is Jonathan Ahn. I'm currently at the University of Washington School of Dentistry. Uh, so I'm a dentist scientist that studies uh, the biology of aging in the context of oral health. Um, let me just make sure, there we go. So age is the single greatest risk factor for many known diseases and decline, uh, including Alzheimer's disease, cancer, as well as heart disease. However, in contrast to um, all these major age-related diseases that the field of aging has focused on, uh, the impact of biological aging and the oral health, that relationship is often neglected. And as a clinician, I commonly see our elderly patients do coming in with various oral conditions. Those could be related to dental cavities, uh, periodontal disease, uh, low saliva or xerostomia, uh, candidiasis, as well as oral cancer. And in fact, understanding the biological mechanism of aging in the oral cavity is critical to not only reduce the impact of age-related decline in the mouth, but really the optimal functionality for any system requires overall organismal health. And this includes uh, oral health. And so for our study to investigate this line of inquiry, we first looked at an oral disease that commonly affects uh, older adults. And we first looked at a disease called periodontal disease, which is a chronic oral inflammatory disease. Um, adults over the age of 65 or roughly about 70% of those adults have some form of periodontal disease. And in fact, the definition of periodontal disease is the inflammation that occurs around the supporting tissues of the teeth that leads to bone loss with a variable microbial pattern. And in fact, one of the clinical hallmarks of this disease is the bone loss that happens around the teeth. And so as with many research inquiries, we first wanted to come up with a model to evaluate this disease and its process during age. Um, prior studies have utilized artificial disease models in young animals or young rodents like this here, uh, CT imaging that we produced in our lab and to induce the inflammation or induce the bone loss to mimic an aging phenotype. However, a limitation in many of these studies is that we lose the actual contribution of the age local as well as systemic environment. And so for our study, we did not want to induce any artificial disease, but we just wanted to evaluate a normative age mice. And in fact, we just, we just discovered that just age alone causes not only periodontal bone loss, like you see here in an old animal, but the fact that both the gum tissue, the gingiva or the bone, there's an increase in inflammatory cytokines or inflammation. And so this is a protein dot-based assay where we're looking at full change of the, of the various cytokines uh, that increase with age uh, relative to the young here set to one. So as we uncovered that age causes common oral disease or periodontal disease, we wanted to evaluate whether targeting the biological aging process could delay this uh, disease. And we decided to investigate the impact of rapamycin. Uh, rapamycin is one of the most robust, uh, most studied, as well as a reproducible intervention for increasing lifespan, as well as delaying age-related phenotypes. Um, rapamycin was first isolated from soil samples on Easter Island. It has a potent immunomodulatory response, as well as genetic studies in yeast first identified that target, which is TOR. And so mTOR, or mechanistic or mammalian TOR, is a nutrient growth factor responsive kinase and is stru structurally functionally conserved from yeast all the way into mammals. And on the left, you're seeing a lifespan data produced by Rich Miller's group as part of the International uh, uh, Interventions Testing Program or ITP by the NIA, uh, where they showed that with increasing dose of rapamycin in the food, we're able to get an increase in lifespan extension in both females and well as males. Um, and like I said, mTOR is a nutrient growth factor responsive kinase. Uh, because our kind of questioning was one of the first studies to look at the relationship between not only just oral health and age, but also the impact of rapamycin, 
to increase the robustness of our study, we had two different animal cohorts going across the United States. So one cohort we based here in Seattle, and then another cohort we had collaborators at the Jackson Laboratory in Bar Harbor, Maine, uh, where we aged those animals to those ages. And then we either gave it a controlled diet or a rapamycin diet for eight weeks, and then they were harvested. Um, with the Jackson cohort, we were also able to take an initial CT imaging before the rapamycin was administered, and then a final CT of the same animal after the rapamycin, um, after the rapamycin treatment. A lot of our data is in the eLife manuscript, uh, so I just wanted to highlight a few of them that kind of uh, kind of ties up all our story. The first is that what we found was that rapamycin was able to attenuate an age-related uh, gingival inflammation. And so on the left, we're showing um, you uh, NF-kappa beta, P65, and IKB alpha, which are the hubs uh, that causes the production of inflammatory cytokines. But we're seeing just in the gum tissue, there's an increase in age, and then rapamycin was able to decrease the, that increased expression. And in fact, various inflammatory cytokines that increase with age was attenuated by rapamycin treatment. If we look at periodontal bone, we used Rankel, which is uh, as a marker for osteoclasts, um, that we see that Rankel expression increases with age, um, but then rapamycin was able to attenuate it. But just like similarly in the gingival tissue, even in the periodontal bone, what we find is that animals treated with rapamycin have this attenuation of inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. If we look at the clinical phenotype, um, what we find is that uh, rapamycin seems to rejuvenate the age-related loss of periodontal bone. So this here is showing you cohorts from here in Seattle where we can do um, a cross-sectional. So these were um, taken um, micro CT imaging of those animals. You can see in the maxilla or the top teeth or the mandible on the lower teeth, uh, just age alone leads to periodontal bone loss. But rapamycin treatment for eight weeks was able to attenuate that. And in fact, if we look at our Jackson laboratory cohorts of the same animals before and after, on the left, this is just one image and we have a few more in the manuscript. Um, you can see on the left, uh, the periodontal bone loss, both in the mandible as well as the maxilla. Um, so the maxillary of the top these, we've highlighted some um, areas of bone loss in the white arrows. And on the right, you're seeing in the orange arrows after the treatment. So again, this is the same animal uh, where we took the image before and after, you can see areas where there seems to be bone deposition around the teeth, um, as well as both in the lower teeth, as well as the top teeth. Um, and finally, what we wanted to also look at was because this disease has a variable microbial pattern, we wanted to look at the oral microbiome. And so this we're looking at alpha diversity. So you're looking at how many different species are within the environment. We find that the old oral microbiome is significantly different from the young. But in fact, if we look at the actual microbial composition, we find that the young and the rapamycin, which is in the turquoise and the blue, are overlapped, while the old oral microbiome is completely segregated, showing that there seems to be this reverted shift of the aged oral microbiome to be more similar to the young oral microbiome. And in fact, if we go back to the very definition of periodontal disease, which is inflammation of the periodontal structures, which includes the gum tissue and the bone, with bone loss, as well as variable microbial pattern, what we find is that rapamycin is able to target all three uh, clinical features of this disease. And so what we're able to include in our paper was that in short-term rapamycin treatment was able to um, impact these three clinical features of periodontal disease and really supporting the geroscience hypothesis that any interventions that target the biological aging process will simultaneously delay multiple age-related disease as well as functional decline. Um, I also wanted to kind of share some additional data that we have kind of in supporting for our evidence is that one of the questions we commonly get is that after the eight-week treatments where we see this rejuvenation of oral health, do those results persist? Um, so um, all this beneficial of the periodontal bone, the microbiome changes and the inflammation, um, does those effects continue on? And in fact, we had a separate cohort um, at the same time where the first animal cohort, what we did was we treated them with the um, eight weeks of a control diet, and then they were transferred into the eight week rapamycin uh, treatment diet. The second cohort we had, uh, we started them on the eight week treatment of rapamycin, but then they came off the rapamycin, they were given just the control diet for eight weeks. And in fact, if we go and look at the wrinkle expression, so um, you were seeing the young, old, and the rapamycin, and then the first column is the control uh, diet and then the rapamycin. 
and then the rapamycin diet and then the control, we find that wrinkle expression maintains its decreased expression levels even after the rapamycin was taken off. And in fact, if you look at IKB alpha, uh, similar to our, our findings previously is that rapamycin not only attenuates that, but it persists even after the rapamycin diet uh, is removed. And really the, if we look at the micro CT imaging of these animals, so these are the animals that were given rapamycin for eight weeks and they were off the diet. We find that initially at baseline before the treatment's given, we see the periodontal bone loss as indicated by the orange arrows. And after eight weeks rapamycin, we see again, very similar to our prior data that there seems to be this regeneration of that bone around the teeth. And when these animals are taken off the rapamycin diet and then they're on the control diet, we find that those results are persistent. Um, and so we're, we're still um, uh, completing some other analysis on this and hopefully we get this prepared during this time. Um, so with that, uh, I just wanna thank uh, the University of Washington, especially Matt Caberline, um, as well as Peter Ravinovich who really allowed me to get started, especially Matt for allowing me to kind of um, get started on this kind of field as well as helping me um, uh, as I gain my independence, as well as our collaborators at Jackson Laboratory. Um, and then obviously Eli for giving me this opportunity to speak today. Um, and these are my support for um, this during the project. So uh, thank you. I'll go in and take any questions. Okay, th thanks, John. We've got a few questions. So, um, so one question was whether, and I think this probably applies generally, whether it's possible to get the uh, the PowerPoint slides um, after after the talks. So, um, all of the talks are recorded, and I believe that the link to the recordings will be sent to to all of the participants. So you can certainly you'll have an opportunity to go back and review the presentations then, and then um, it'll be up to each individual speaker if they want to to actually share the PowerPoint slides if, if people want to request that directly. And it sounds like uh, Anya can uh, can help uh, connect participants with the with the speakers if that's something you want to you want to seek. Um, so one question is uh, how different were the oral microbiota between facilities between Jackson and UW and was that a, a confounding um, variable? So yeah, I think it might, I think it leads to kind of this batch effect and that was actually included within it. Um, so there was not, surprisingly, there was not much of a difference in the oral microbiome because um, it could be related to their resolution. But if we just look at kind of the final levels, there was not a difference between the Jackson Laboratory as well as the University of Washington. Um, especially when we look at those treated with rapamycin, um, they were very close. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, great data, nice talk, really impressive information. Two questions. The first one is why did you choose six month old mice as the young control group? Uh, and then the second question is uh, osteopontin deposition did not seem to be increased after rapamycin treatment. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so for the first question of six months, um, that was just based upon um, uh, a linear trend, you know, the, the young animals, there was a range, um, we always say between, you know, six to eight months. Um, the other reason why um, the young animals for us, um, because we had the adult cohorts, we knew that there was going to be an, uh, if there was an age related trend, uh, that the younger animals, even they were at six months, would show a difference, at least with the adult animals. Um, and also because um, uh, our primary or preliminary data that we utilize uh, was not only from the ITP studies, but also from uh, Peter Ravinovich's cohort, uh, Peter Ravinovich's cohort, and they actually use a similar month of uh, age mice. So that's why we picked the six month old uh, younger animals. Um, to the second question of osteopon, yeah. So uh, one reason is could just be is that the way we collected the mandible bone. So osteopon is, uh, like you mentioned, one of the osteoblast regulators. And, you know, in the mandible bone, there's both trabecular bone and cortical bone. And so for our study, we just we just took the whole entire mandible bone to do it. And so maybe the subtle differences between osteopon was not detected. Um, uh, we could, if we do, if we go back and look at our histology slides, we would actually do trabecular versus cortical, we may be able to see osteopon, but uh, because that was kind of out of scope of what we wanted to look at, we did not look. If you're interested, we could always send you the slides because um, we have those. And if you want to look at osteopon, but that would be something of interest. Um, um, so. Thanks, John. And this wasn't asked, but sort of related. I'm gonna I'm gonna push you to 
to give people some some clues here. So I think one of the questions is, you know, when we see these effects of like bone regrowth or you know regeneration, not just from rapamycin but from other aging interventions as well, you know, there's always the question about is that sort of you know high quality regeneration. And so, do you know anything about? So you showed that the bone regrowth seems to persist. Do you know anything about the quality of that bone? Is it brittle? Is it likely to break? I, I think this is, you know, clearly an important question as we think about um, translation of some of these interventions. Right. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we actually um, recently um, uh, uh, set up a collaboration with the mechanical engineering department, mechanical engineering department here at the University of Washington, where. Um, normally, what we could do is look at uh, these biological structures um, using what's called a nano draw, uh, uh, nano indenter. So basically, normally for crowns, for example, I'm going to a little bit of dentistry is we could look at the, kind of the strength of that material uh, utilizing this um, device called a nano indenter, where we could look at kind of the modulus and um, the hardness of that structure. And in fact, we actually did that with some of our animals. And what we find is that much like in a lot of this data is also in femurs, but we do see it with age that there was um, um, more modulus as well as less hardness. And in fact, those animals treated with rapamycin, their bone quality was actually better than the old animals. And so we haven't really published that data yet. Um, I know you kind of pushed me on that, Matt. <laughs> but um, the, so we're actually finding that um, utilizing this kind of mechanical engineering technique that the bone is actually better, uh, even though there is more. Now, the concern is obviously, you know, it, uh, one of the questions you're leading to is, it, does it lead to osteoporosis? But what we're thinking is actually, it actually is making the bone a little bit stronger around the area uh, of that. Great, thank you. So one comment, uh, very interesting data. It would be good to test the effect of rapamycin on cancer development in the long term. Probably the mouse model is not good enough for that. So you don't, you can respond to that if you want to. I don't know if there's anything on oral cancers that you would think about looking at. I know that's an age-related um, Yeah. Condition. So um, I know that they've done it in tongue where, it, again, it's some kind of artificial way to do it, but they irradiate the animals um, uh, and they induce this kind of cancer in the tongue. And, and in fact, that paper is actually published years ago, but they actually showed that pre-treatment with rapamycin is able to kind of uh, help um, uh, reduce the impact of kind of tongue cancer. Uh, but beyond that, I haven't seen any literature on it, but yeah, that would be definitely something of interest uh, to in a mice model. Obviously it's an it's an induced model. So um, we'll have to think about um, the best way to approach that. Yep. And then the last question is, uh, what was the dose of rapamycin? And I think they're asking based on body weight. I don't know if you have that off the top of your head, but maybe just um, comment on the dosing. Yeah, so um, our dosing, we just did uh, 42 parts per million in the food. Um, and so, um, you know, we could go back to look at how much each uh, mouse got based on the rapamycin blood levels as well. But, and we picked that 42 parts per million dose because that was the highest dose that the ITP study went to show the lifespan extension. And, and because this was the first time we were completing it, we wanted to see uh, that if there was any phenotype that with the highest dose of rapamycin, that they're, they're, um, it was highly likely to see a certain phenotype. So that's why we went with that. Our protocol should be published on the e-protocols. Um, and if you don't, you could always uh, uh, look at our paper or contact me directly and I can give you the protocol uh, on how we uh, created that, the, the child for it. Great, thanks, John. Yeah, and I'll just mention, I think, um, like John said, this was the dose that, that has been used by the interventions testing program. And I think they did some calculations in that, that paper where they first used the 42 parts per million to give an estimate of body weight, but of course, you know, this is variable depending on how much each individual animal eats. And so I think it's not typically, not typically quantified that way in, in mouse experiments. Um, okay, so we are right on time. Thanks, John, that was great.